Today's show is brought to you by locally owned and operated Highland Rem Speedway. Highland Rem Speedway is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year with great short track door-to-door stop car racing in a safe, family-friendly atmosphere. Visit their website at highlandrim.com. Jeff Meeks and Chris Austin invite you to watch your favorite sports event at the Batter's Box at 43 Hermitage Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. The Batter's Box offers shuttle service to all Titans home games. It's a great place for friends to gather for the game and after the game. So check out the Batter's Box Bar and Grill, and thanks again for sponsoring the show. Well, the break is over, and it's back to work for the Pit Pass guys and for those guys in NASCAR and their teams. Hi, I'm Joe Williams, and coming up next on Pit Pass with Larry Woody. We're going to begin the 2013 season with a look at the top 10 stories from 2012. We'll also talk a little bit about NASCAR preseason thunder going on this week in Daytona. And on the local front, some big news coming out of Highland Rim. All that and more coming up next on Pit Pass. Bandwidth for today's show is brought to you by SoftLayer.com. We love SoftLayer here at Talkopolis. They are the greatest hosting company ever. They make everything easy. Check out their website at SoftLayer.com. Thanks again for sponsoring the show. From the family grocery hauler to fire-breathing racing engines, the one name you need to know is USA Motor and Machine, located at 51 Cleveland Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. Give them a call at 615-726-3725 or at usamotorandmachine.com. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Pit Pass. I'm Joe Williams, along with my idol, Larry Woody, who's you know, I say that a lot, but Larry, I actually mean that. I want to start off 2013 being as honest as I can possibly be. Joe, we can tell it's sincere. It comes straight from the heart. And thank I mean, you. literally, it has for years. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I grew up reading what this man was writing. And then I went to trying to change what he was writing. Reading was a whole lot easier. I was much more successful with the reading. The big words stumped you, admit it. <laughs> Every once in a while. How are you? Have a good Christmas. Had a great Christmas. At our house, nothing blew up or burned down, so we came out ahead. <laughs> That's always a plus. That's a plus, yeah. All right, 2013. Larry, what is this? Your 35th, 40th? Uh, dog years, it's 120. <laughs> Sports rider years. <laughs> no, I started in uh, 68. 68, covering my first race, and I didn't know which direction the cars ran. So, so this and, is and some people, 46. including Daryl Waltrip, say I haven't learned much. You still haven't figured it out. I'm still kind of back at 68. It, it's fun, and another new year. It's that's the great thing about this sport, Joe. No matter all the disappointments from last year, that's an old year. Everybody rolls out at Daytona in February, brand new year, new cars, new attitude, new everything. Everybody's a champion when they come out at Daytona. I could always tell when the, the first of the year was coming around, start of the season, because Larry, literally, there, there was always a change. You, you kind of, yep. you perked up a little bit and, and yep. you, you could always tell. Has there ever been a year that, that you've gone mm -hmm. into and said, no, nah, I don't want to do this anymore? Not really, as I, as I traveled with the Tennessean for, you know, for 30 some odd years and some odder than others, yeah, the, the travel true. and the grind and so forth would get old. Joe, you'd literally wake up in hotel rooms and you wouldn't, you'd have to lie there for a minute and try to remember what city you're in because you'd go, you know, airports, sure. taxis, airplanes, rental cars, that kind of thing. That grind grew old, but as far as, once you got to the racetrack and saw all your buddies around, it's kind of like a traveling circus, as you know. Once you got to the track, saw all the drivers that used to be so much fun to hang out with, all your sports riding buddies, that, that never got old, and that's the part I still miss, being away from the, from the Tennessee. I used to kid you every once in a while about, you know, the only difference between what I was doing every day and what you were doing is that your commute was you know, a couple thousand miles more than mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because once you get, you could tell, once you got to the racetrack, that was your office, you were in your element. Yeah. And every time I'd complain about how tough my job was, my buddy Roadhog would remind me, you're <laughs> traveling around the country covering stock car races on expense account. What are you whining about? That's right. So uh, it's all, a, it, Roadhog had a way of putting things into perspective, Joe. He, he was right. What, what am I complaining about? Sounds, I could have had a real job. Yeah, it sounds a lot like my wife. <laughs> uh, tell you what, let's, uh, we, we've talked about some things. 2012 is over. It's finished. It's done. Larry, let's talk about what I pulled down as the top 10 stories of 2012. David Letterman, go right ahead. You think? Okay. In, in, in reverse order. In reverse order. Number 10, Fox is re up for 2012, or excuse me, 15 to 2022. 2.4 billion, Larry, for 13 races a year plus the truck series. Two point five. That's with a B, Larry. 
That's pretty good money. I remember when James Hilton won a, a race and they gave him a case of Pepsi for first, <laughs> for first race. So uh, there's a little more money in it nowadays than uh, the old days. In 1984, the last cup race at Nashville broadcast, we were so excited. We had maxed things out. We got five grand. Five grand. Five grand for the rights. And now? Well, you just divide yeah. 2.4 by, what, seven years and divide that again by 13. Yeah. and. Now, if you can you imagine offering uh, Jimmy Johnson five grand for winning a race? That wouldn't gas up his motorhome oh, <laughs> for the infield. You couldn't uh, offer the, Jimmy the, Johnson five grand to come sign yeah, autographs. Yeah, he would show up at a car lot to, yeah. for, for that. So. But it's good. I think it's good. Yeah. These guys are the best athletes in the world. I'm glad to see that they're they're finally being recognized as professional athletes and being being paid professional athlete money for going out and risking their uh, necks 36 weekends a year. They deserve it. Very good. Number nine. Brad Keselowski got hailed, if you'll remember, for tweeting during the race early. I think it's Daytona. Then he got fined 25 grand for doing the same thing later in the season because they considered his smartphone a computer. Yep. And then, and then reversed their position, as NASCARs <laughs> want to do. I was just thinking, you know, how far this uh, sport has come. I don't remember Junior Johnson ever having a problem tweeting at the track, do you? No. <laughs> No, I was gonna say, you know, the, the other half is I remember that the only uh, additional equipment that I ever saw in a race car mm. was Dick Trickle kept a cigarette lighter mm. in his race car yep. and smokes taped and when he got a caution, he would take care. Yep. But tweeting was not a problem. No, tweeting was not. Well, old you days. can't smoke and tweet at the same no, time. No, of course you can't. <laughs> Trust me. At least Brad didn't tweet while he was driving, though. He, at least the car well, was parked. That's illegal, yeah. That, that, he, that was parked. So that's just, truly illegal. Yeah. At least in Tennessee. And, and I assume in NASCAR, <laughs> I'm assuming NASCAR will let the drivers tweet while they're going 200 miles an hour down the back stretch. Keep your fingers crossed. All right, number <laughs> eight. For the first time in history, the Daytona 500 was rain delayed to Monday, but it was not without excitement. On the bright side, Juan Pablo Montoya created a two-hour fire delay when he drilled the jet dryer. <laughs> An interesting thing, that's the only vehicle Juan Pablo ever caught up to the rest of the season. Well, you know, he started the year, he hit everything else the year before. He was just trying to make sure that he got there. Like the old, uh, well, Harry Hyde uh, memo to, uh, to Tim Richmond yeah. that year he, when he had had four or five wrecks and he said, should I park it? And Harry said, no, stay out till the pace car comes out and try to hit it. That way you hit every you hit vehicle on the track. That's right. So, kind of the same which, way with one pop, Which was though. used in Days of Thunder, if you'll recall. That's right. I want you to go back out there and hit the pace car. <laughs> You've hit everything else. <laughs> Number six. Or excuse me, we're at number seven. Former champ uh, Matt Kenseth is leaving Roush Fenway Racing. He, it's the only place he's ever known yep. as a cup driver. Now he's going to uh, Joe Gibbs Racing to replace Joey Logano, mm -hmm. which I really thought would have happened the year before, but yep. he, he got another year out of it. Matt's a good little driver. He's just real low-key, low-maintenance, flies under the radar. I don't think he's ever gotten credit for maybe being as good a driver as he is because he just doesn't make any waves. He goes out and does his job. But frankly, Joe, the last two or three years have just not been very productive. I think it's a good move for Matt, probably for Roush, too. Sometimes you need a change of scenery just for the sake of change. So. I think Matt will do well. I was going to say, it's kind of after that, you know, he won the Daytona 500 this year. Won a championship in the past. Yeah, but when you win the Daytona 500, that's the kiss of death. You're not going to win the title. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then he won uh, the the last race, the, the uh, chase race in mm -hmm. Talladega mm -hmm. after that big mess mm -hmm. on the last lap. Uh, speaking of making moves and going, Kevin Harvick announced that he's leaving Richard Childress Racing. And he did this uh, two days after winning the first RCR <laughs> race that he's won at Phoenix in a while. Unfortunately, he made the announcement before he talked to Richard Childress, apparently. <laughs> and also, Joe, interestingly enough, the change won't go into effect till next season. He and Richard are still going to be racing together in 2013. And like we are saying before we came on, it's got like telling your girlfriend you're yeah. fed up with her, you're moving out, but you're going to stay one more year yeah. in their apartment. And then next year, yeah. by golly, I'm gone. Yeah, after so the you prom. Wonder, when well, the be, prom is done, might we're, be a we're little, gone. Might be a little tense around some of those RCR <laughs> meetings with me. Although, you know, it's worked with different people. You know, Casey Keene, you know, he, yeah. he left a year early, announced he was leaving, so I don't know, but I still think there could be a little tension hanging over that operation this season. Uh, number five, the hottest driver of the past two years, Kyle Busch, struggled to win at all levels and even admitted it. We had, we had the video here. Yep. Yeah, it's one of those years from a guy who you still think is talented, and I'm still hoping will 
this could be a big continue year. Continue to improve with his uh, the, uh, uh, personality delivery. Joe, I think this could be a telling season for Kyle Busch. Were all that, was that previous success a fluke? or was he as good as I and a lot of people thought he was, I think this could be a, se a very telling season for uh, little Kyle. Oh, I hadn't thought about it that way. That's a good point. Top story number four for the year. Dale Earnhardt Jr. finally, finally broke that long losing streak with a win at Michigan. Made the chase, but not long after suffered a concussion. His second one, he later admitted, in that big, uh, big one crash on the last lap at Talladega. He missed two races, fell out of a chance at the title. Uh, Larry uh, got real honest right there yep. at the end and said, you know, yeah, I, I, yeah, I wasn't real sure. Yeah, and it's got to be tough, a tough call for Junior to make, Joe, to get out of that car. Now, realistically, he wasn't in title contention at that point. You know, he was, even if he raced, didn't miss those two races, he probably wasn't going to be in contention for the championship. But, you know, how tough it is for these guys to get out, I think it's significant, Joe, because in the old days, and, and, and NASCAR, like in the NFL uh, football, you just kind of struggle, la almost laugh it off. In the NFL, they say, yeah, he got his bell rung. Nowadays, they realize how serious that is. And the question is, will there be any kind of lingering effects from the concussion for Junior that might make him get it, decide to get out of the car permanently? Yeah. And uh, that's something to watch out for, I think, uh, as the season develops and if he is involved in some more hard crashes. You know, the scary part about that is, in, in all honesty, um, I used to kid about having played football and getting yeah. it. got your now, bell rung. Yeah, now yeah. I'm, you know, between that and a couple of other things, I'm beginning to wonder sometimes. Yeah, it might, it might explain a lot. To well, it Joe. could. All right, top story <laughs> number three. After being fired again, Kurt Busch looked to restart his career with Phoenix Racing. That took a detour, though, uh, when he was suspended again mm. by NASCAR for verbally attacking a journalist mm. at Dover. You know, Larry, I know you've you've had drivers that you just, as a journalist, you just don't get along with sometimes. Mm -hmm. Maybe a personality thing. One one bad question, and you're on yeah. the list forever. This guy just seems to keep doing it over and over yeah. and over again with multiple people, yeah. not just media members, but others. Yeah, he, Kurt's about to, to wear out his welcome, as is his younger brother. But the Bush brothers have two things in common: they're tremendously talented. And uh, they have rotten personalities <laughs> and, and are hard to get along with, hard to live with. And so at some point, the, the, the rotten personalities start to outweigh the talent on the track, and it catches up with them. It caught up with Kurt, as you said, this year. I think it may catch up with Kyle. To their credit, they seem to acknowledge they've got some, uh, some temper problems and uh, are trying to, uh, try, trying to, you know, work with it, straighten it out, but the question is, can they do it? And I don't know. I, I don't think that question's unanswered. We might see the two most talented drivers in NASCAR since the Allison brothers that are both going to sideline themselves, not because they can't cut it on the track, but because they can't cut it off the track. I, I think, and those of you who know me, you're going to find this, I think Kyle's closer than Kurt will ever be yeah. to being able to make that change. It's almost Shakespearean to see two bright, talented kids like that just almost determined to self-destruct. Yeah. Big story number two on the season. Jeff Gordon finally lost his cool, crashed Clint Boyer at Phoenix. That ended Boyer's shot at the title when he was still in contention. Now, the outburst cost Gordon, the former champ, a fine, docked him points, got put on probation, and he's still smiling. And earned him a million fans. That's right. Stock car drivers like to, stock car fans like to see a little uh, grit in their drivers. And I remember when uh, Jeff Gordon crashed Earnhardt at Daytona one year, his popularity soared. I think again, uh, Joe, fans don't mind seeing that. They like to see a little uh, little give and take out on the track. Also, I think it's significant because it shows Jeff Gordon is not content just to ride off into the twilight of his career quietly like an old John Wayne movie. He's still fiery and determined to win some races and compete for a championship. And the, the, I think the frustrations boiled over with the Boyer uh, incident. And again, that reflects how much Jeff is determined not to just fade away quietly in this sport. He wants to get out there and win some races and, and, and another championship. championship. Yeah, and to prove that, he won the last race of the year down at Homestead. Which is a good way to start the new year. Yeah. The number one story, at least from everything that I can gather from uh, all my sources, give credit to the captain, Roger Penske, for finally winning his first cup title. And he did it with a relative rookie. And Brad Keselowski, and not rookie, but relative. I mean, you know, he had less than 100 starts. The captain and the kid. Yeah, going into the season, Keselowski had less than 100 starts. And uh, another unique twist, 
uh, the champions manufacturer Dodge announced that it was leaving NASCAR competition again. Uh, Joe, I think the story there is, first of all, what a wonderful st human interest story. The wonderful old Roger Penske, been, you know, decades in the sport and never won a NASCAR championship. Like you said, uh, uh, Keselowski, the kid, comes in and gets the, 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 the grand old patriarch, his first title. The significance of the, of the car change, Joe, is just stunning. You've won a championship driving Dodges and you dump your Dodges. So that tells you why, how important models are. They, I, I don't think the model of car makes a bit of difference anymore, Joe. Uh, certainly not for the teams, as we can see. Penske just won his first championship ever yeah. and, and is, is throwing his old, old Dodges off the yeah. cliff to try to go to Ford. The people in the stands, Joe, I just don't believe the younger generations are car guys like they were growing up with when you yeah. and I and people were working on their cars and the muscle cars and stuff. I, I, don't, I don't detect that. My, my kid wants to the old man to give him a car that's, that'll start and stop and take him to where he wants to go and bring him home at the end of the day. Yeah. That's all they care about. And I think that's significant. NASCAR's trying to regain, regain some of this model loyalty with, with the new cars, which we'll talk about later. I'm not sure they can do it because I think the mindset of the fans has changed. I don't think we got car guys like we did when you and I were. Well, you're probably right. Now, in, in fairness to Penske and those guys, Dodge is getting out. They're not just no, ditching them. Dodge is walking away, and they're not going to support them. They can still run the models that they have. Which tells you another yeah. big story, Joe, about the manufacturer loyalty. Used to manufacturers were scrambling over each other to mm -hmm. get in. I could still I remember the, the big uh, uh, deal when Dodge came in that year because Casey Atwood here in Nashville right. was going to drive one of the right. new Dodges. He and Bill Elliott racing for Everham Sports. I flew to Charlotte to cover the Dodge's coming out party. Now, a few years later, Dodge Dodge is getting out of town. Yeah. <laughs> Dodge is getting out of Dodge, as we say. Oh, yeah. And uh, so that tells you manufacturer loyalty. I think it's dawned on them. People don't buy on Monday based on who won on Sunday anymore, like they did in the old days. Well, and the other thing is, Larry, it's not like there's only three or four plates from name plates from Detroit that we all recognize. Right. There are 20 or 30 names out there, many of whom uh, you know, don't have, uh, shall we say, American sounding names. Yep. But we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that, too, a little bit later. All right, a little bit long here. Those are what we thought were the top ten stories of 2012. When we come back, we'll talk about the start of the 2013 season. Getting underway this weekend in Daytona. Stay with us on Pit Pass. Jeff Meeks and Chris Austin invite you to watch your favorite sports event at the Batter's Box at 43 Hermitage Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. The Batter's Box offers shuttle service to all Titans home games. It's a great place for friends to gather for the game and after the game. So check out the Batter's Box Bar and Grill, and thanks again for sponsoring the show. Welcome back, everybody, to Pit Pass. Larry Woody, Joe Williams. I want to say hello to our friends at Highland Rim Speedway. They're up on Bethel Road. Action about to get started up there. As a matter of fact, here in a little while, we're going to have some key dates for you. The biggest one to remember, opening night, April 13th. We'll have more for you, though as we go through uh, go through the show. Larry, we've talked about it last year. Let's talk about mm -hmm. this year. They're going to get everything started uh, this weekend. Now, now, we are shooting on a Wednesday, so tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, mm -hmm. it's uh, NASCAR preseason thunder in Daytona, rolling out the Gen 6 race car for the first time that it'll be on the racetrack. It's been through the wind tunnel, but now they're going to put it on the racetrack with other race cars Larry, this Gen 6 car is designed to be, quote, more racy and to look more like um, stock cars, going back to the stock bodies. Right. The car tomorrow, the concept of the car tomorrow was great, but until, uh, you know, until you can recognize on the racetrack the car that you drove to get to the racetrack mm -hmm. or that you rented to drive to get to the racetrack, then you're you're just you're just doing an IROC series, the old International Race of Champions, where everything was supposedly equal. All the cars were equal, and drivers just drew for them. I think, Joe. First of all, you got to give NASCAR credit for the car of tomorrow, uh, because of the safety innovations. Yeah. You know, we saw some horrendous looking wrecks with the car of tomorrow, and yet there was weren't any drivers seriously injured. Junior got a concussion, but in the old days. Some of those wrecks, drivers wouldn't have walked away from, as you and I well know. So, right. but that's you know, kudos to NASCAR for the safety innovations in the car tomorrow. Now, the next step is if they can keep the safety innovations, and as NASCAR said, make the cars a little racier. Now, I, I still think the, the real objective is, like you say, to make the cars more stock, so the fan, or you get that fan model loyalty back, manufacturer loyalty, that kind of thing, re and regain some of that. If they can get the perfect combination, the, the, the safety features of the car tomorrow, the, the racier 
more stock looking cars of the Gen 6 or whatever they're calling these new models, then they'll have the perfect combination. I still don't know, Joe, the bottom line is if, if racers don't want to race, I'm not sure you can make them race. And I, I got to tell you, I think in the last few years, I don't detect that, that racing desire in a lot of the drivers the way we did in the old days. And part of it may be they're so, so wealthy you can make $3 million by finishing 43rd every yep. weekend. Uh, you're going to, you know, they're racing for points now. The objective is not to so much go out and win the race, but to go out and have a good, safe finish and get those points and don't have any wipeouts. I, I think, Joe, there's a there's a mentality change in drivers, and I'm not sure that changing models, uh, changing car designs, is going to change that mentality. Larry, do you get the feeling that the drivers have have changed from being drivers to being an advertising medium? Uh, they, they've, they, they've quit. They've quit being drivers now. They're they're for lack of a better term at the moment, pitchman. No, no question about that. There's no question. You, and the Bush brothers being the perfect example in the old days, you know, rough, tough drivers, if you, if you get, got the job done on the track, nobody cared what you did off the track. Nowadays, you can't do that. You've got to have the combination of talent and off the track, as you said, <laughs> the pitchman ability. And, uh, you know, you could argue whether that's good or bad, but it's a fact of life. It's got to be done nowadays. Uh, but again, on, on the track, I just don't detect that, that the old the, the Kale Yarborough type mentality, you know, where you got out, and if you didn't, like I used to say in the old days, wreck or wreck or win, you know, Bobby Allison yeah. said the second place driver across the, is just the first loser to cross the finish right. line. I, I don't detect that kind of mentality in today's drivers. You know, I, I'm kind of torn, Larry. There, there, there's a point at which they've got to do their job. Their job is obviously to take care of their sponsors, but somewhere along the line, I, I think they've they've become more concerned with making that, not making a, a, a move, an aggressive move to win a race as you're talking mm -hmm. about, uh, because one of two things, either they're already making enough money, boy if I do this could I get hurt, mm -hmm. or if I do this do I get hurt and I don't make that corporate appearance Tuesday? And cost myself in the point standings. And that's it, Joe, that, that goes back to your top ten list about Jeff Gordon and Clint Boyer. The, the, their, their run in in the old days, that was just a racing incident. I mean, people talk about it for a weekend and forget it. On, you know, we're still talking about it into the new year because it's so so stunning. Two car, stock car drivers wrecked each other trying to win a race. Yeah, isn't it amazing? Yeah, what, what's the sport what's coming? What's this all about? What's the sport coming And it to? wasn't Talladega and it wasn't Daytona. No, what's... And, and they weren't particularly running for position yeah, at the time. It wasn't Boyer, Bristol. Boyer was technically in championship position, but basically they just ran into each other because they were mad, didn't like each other. And in the old days, that was what the sport was about. Nowadays, the, the mentality has changed so much that it's stunning when two two stock car drivers don't like each other and crash each other on the track. So again, that's we digress from your your, your new car <laughs> model to the old style mentality. But I do think that's a, something NASCAR's got to consider. But back to your point, it will be interesting to see how these cars run at Daytona. When you get a bunch of them out on the track, will they be more, in NASCAR's words, racier? Yeah. We'll get a chance to find out. Now, they'll be on the track um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday from 9 in the morning till noon and then from 1 to 5 Eastern time, which means that's 8 to noon and, no, it's 8 to 11. and It's an hour earlier here in the Central Time. I can't do the math in my head right now. But uh, Speed Channel will be carrying all that. Uh, they're going to be rotating some anchors through and, and uh, doing some reporting from pit road. So it'll be a good chance to see how they look, what the reaction of the drivers might be. And Joe, as you know, race fans are just like football fans who get excited in the preseason with the, it does, nothing counts, nothing matters, it's all practice, preparation, tune-ups, but fans are ready for to hear some, some motors on the track oh, and yeah. smell, the, smell the rubber burning. So oh, this, yeah. is, uh, this is our time of year. Speaking of TV, if you get a hold of this uh, early enough this evening, uh, on Wednesday night, that's tonight, January the 9th, Jeff Gordon will be on CBS, their program. I get that a lot. Jeff's going to be playing, or playing, he's going to be uh, acting as a uh, clerk at a parts store, Larry. Uh, the, the catch, the, the gist of the show is they put famous people in unusual spots and wait and see how many folks actually recognize them. You know, hey, you like Jeff Gordon. Yeah, I get that a lot. What a concept. Now, the problem is, Gordon's <laughs> appearance may be a bit overshadowed because also on this edition, uh, working at a, uh, a warehouse store will be a guy by the name of Larry Hagman, mm. you know, J.R. Ewing, who mm. passed away in November. This is like the last show that he shot mm. before he passed away. So I will bet you 
that that will probably supersede mm. Mr. Mm. Gordon's time mm. on the air. Also, uh, as we close this sex segment, I want to say hi to our friends at USA Motor and Machine over on Cleveland. You know, if, uh, if you still got it in your mind to be kind of a do-it-yourself or they can do all the machining that you need done, or if you just need it fixed, go see them. They can either take care of it or point you in the right direction. That's USA Motor Machine on Cleveland Avenue. Coming up, we're going to close this one out. Talk a little bit about local racing and some big and good news coming out of Highland Rim Speedway. Stay with us. Today's show is brought to you by locally owned and operated Highland Rim Speedway. Highland Rim Speedway is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year with great short track door-to-door -door stock car racing in a safe, family-friendly atmosphere. Visit their website at highlandrim.com. And welcome back, everybody, to the final segment of this edition of Pit Pass. Joe Williams and Larry Woody. When we're done, we may well head out to Hermitage Avenue, get a little lunch at the batter's box. Go see our friends out there, uh, be it uh, to watch the game or just Grab a bite of lunch. They can take care of you. That's a batter's box at 43 Hermitage Avenue. Larry, uh, some news coming out of Highland Rim Speedway this week that uh, I think is really exciting. Uh, and it's not necessarily all racing related. One of the things that we've been following, uh, the front, there's a front wheel driver. Front wheel drive driver. He drives in that division at the rim. Uh, Daniel Harper, whose 18-month-old son, Kensington, uh, had some real issues uh, with some kidneys. Well, insurance wasn't going to cover everything. The REM did a big fundraiser. Two days ago, on Monday, Daniel was able to donate a kidney to his son. That's got to be kind of special to begin with. The good news is Daniel and Kensington both doing well. Everything's working the way it should, and that's got to make everybody feel. That's just a feel-good story. If you want to add to that one, uh, Daniel missed his sister's birthday, which was Monday, but he's okay with that. She's okay with that because on Tuesday, she made him an uncle. Talk about a wild 48 mm -hmm. hours. And I'll bet you, I'll bet you, both of those kids uh, will have a race car in their hands before too long. Yeah, Joe, like you said, that's one of those nice heartwarming stories. Good, good people doing good deeds good cause and uh, Highland Rim is noted for that you know over the years they've held a lot of fundraisers they've been involved in a lot of community uh, action projects and so forth and I remember when I was covering a few years ago they're involved in the Tabitha uh, Tudors, uh, Tudors yeah. uh, effort to find Tabitha you know and uh, Buddy Williams one of the track owners actually put her picture and some numbers to call and so forth on his race car so Highland Rim has a history of uh, doing good deeds. Highland Rim, Buddy, uh, Roger, Jerry, the whole bunch right. I mean that's that's kind of the way they are. Now right. Local racing. About time to get started. The rim is finally, I say finally, that's not fair. They have announced what their plans are as far as uh, opening their schedules. First practice is March 30th. You think about it, Larry, that's uh, two, uh, two and a half months maybe. And the thing, Joe, as you know, this as we speak, the, the drivers, mechanics, people like this are frantically getting those cars built now. They used to joke about when we in the media would talk about the season starting, they'd say, no, our season started two months yeah, ago. This exactly. is our busy time of year scrambling to get those cars ready to get on the track and also scrambling, Joe, to get sponsorships in place and so forth. You don't just show up at the first race of the season and announce, I've, I just landed a sponsor this morning. These guys are out there you know, beating the bushes right now for that. So this is a time of year when, when the work's done. They say once the season starts, that's the fun time. But you're right. They roll out yeah. on the track and uh, a little, yeah. little over two and a half. I'm almost three months, but this yeah. is uh, this is the hard time. But the uh, the first practice is the 30th. The first uh, media day is going to be on April 6th, and then the opening night will be April 13th. It's my understanding they're going to run basically every week from then on out to October. That's the way weekly racing. That's why you call it weekly racing. Yeah. And I'm glad to see it, done. Joe. We've said many times, you know, I, I, at one point I thought some of these wonderful old racetracks were going to just wither and die away. And so I'm glad to see that Buddy and his partners and have saved that track and saved some other tracks around the area. It's a, it's a wonderful sport. It's amateur, amateur level. It's racing just for the sheer love of racing. And I, I think it's fun to watch. And great story from the media standpoint. There's no better stories. I could go to Highland Rim and get a dozen good stories yeah. rather than go to Daytona and stand in line for two hours to get an appointment to talk to Jimmy Johnson for <laughs> 15 seconds. So from the media standpoint, it, it's, it's a gold mine, little, little well, tracks like that. And the other half, Larry, is we talked earlier about, you know, the drivers today may not, that, that, 
that lack of aggressive, I want to get there because I want to win. I'm here because on this level, they will put that nose where there may not be enough room because they want to win. Sure. And, they, you know, it, it's just a completely different mentality. And, and they aren't racing, as we said before, Joe, for, for fame and glory. They aren't going to get either, either one at Highland Rim or any of these other little tracks around, around the area. They're racing just because they love racing. So it's, uh, that, that, I think that's part of the, the charm and attraction for these little, little bull rings that we, we love so much. I say, based on our tax returns, I think we've both been doing it for the same reason for the past couple of decades well, I, anyway. I, I don't know about you, and I got filthy rich covering this sport. You did? <laughs> wow, I got to, excuse me, I'm going to have to take him out back and figure out how to pull that off. Final thought this week, want to say hello to our old friend Ray Clark, better known around the racetrack as Truck, owned cars for Ronnie Moore and for Bobby Hamilton. Uh, won a couple titles with Bobby out at the old fairgrounds. Uh, hope he's feeling better, Ray. Apparently had a heart attack right before Christmas, and of course we, we had Gary Baker on the last yeah. couple of weeks because we were able to get some things. We've kind of taken a break, yeah. and uh, didn't have a chance to say, Ray uh, Truck, hope you're feeling better. Thanks for being a part of this great community, Larry. We've wrapped up another one. We get ready for next week. We'll get a chance to see what the cars look like. Get a chance to talk about it. And uh, maybe a story about Danica Patrick developing too. Mention mention that coming up. Larry's just a worth, tease. Worth tuning in for. Yeah, but he's, that's what he's teasing you so you'll come back. Now, there's a line there and we're not going there. Folks, I want to thank you for joining us on Pit Pass. Hope you have a great week. For Larry Woody, I'm Joe Williams. We'll see you next time right here on Pit Pass.